from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. WETA, in cooperation with the Library of Congress, presents Verse and Conversation. Now here is your moderator, Mr. William J. Smith, consultant in poetry, the Library of Congress. We are delighted to welcome back to Washington two of the country's most celebrated poets, Miss Louise Bogan and Mr. J.V. Cunningham. Louise Bogan served as the consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress for the 1945-46 term. Alan Tate said of her in 1944 that she had a sustained power and a sense of form that nobody else can quite equal. Mr. Tate's judgment is borne out by the publication of, of Louise Bogan's most recent book, The Blue Estuaries, Poems 1923-1926, which clearly establishes her in the United States as the leading woman lyric poet of the 20th century. Miss Bogan's earlier volumes include The Sleeping Fury, Poems 1937, and Collected Poems 1923-1953, published in 1954. For almost four decades, poetry reviewer of The New Yorker, Miss Bogan is, of course, equally well known as a critic of poetry. A volume of her selected criticism appeared in 1955. I personally know Louise Bogan not only as a poet and a critic, but also as an anthologist, since it was my great pleasure to collaborate with her in compiling The Golden Journey, Poems for Young People, published in 1965, which has happily found a wide audience in schools and libraries. Miss Bogan has received awards from Poetry, the National Institute of Arts and Letters, Brandeis University, and in 1955, she shared with Leonie Adams the Bollingen Prize in Poetry. Like Louise Bogan, J.V. Cunningham is a writer in the classic manner, a master of the short poem whose output, although small, has never varied in its excellence. In 1961, Mr. Tom Gunn called him one of the most accomplished poets alive and one of the few of whom it can be said that he will still be worth reading in 50 years' time. Mr. Cunningham's books of poetry include The Helmsman, 1942, The Judge's Fury, 1947, The Exclusions of a Rhyme, Poems and Epigrams, 1960, To What Strangers, What Welcome, A Sequence of Short Poems, 1964, and the recently published Some Salt, 1967. Mr. Cunningham is well known also as a critic and a scholar. He has been professor of English since 1953 at Brandeis University. He was a Guggenheim Fellow in 1959 and again in 1966 and a grantee of the National Institute of Arts and Letters in 1965 and of the National Endowment for the Arts in 1966-67. And now I'd like to ask first Miss Bogan to read one of her most famous poems, a Song for the Last Act. Right. This is a poem which um, was rewritten after a good many years uh, of being in a being unfinished in a portfolio and as you will see it's in three recognizable sections of sort of cryptiches now that I have your face by heart I look less at its features than its darkening frame where quince and melon yellow as young flame lie with quilled dahlias and the shepherd's crook. Beyond a garden, there in insolent ease, the lead and marble figures watch the show of yet another summer loath to go, although the scythes hang in the apple trees. Now that I have your face by heart, I look. Now that I have your voice by heart, I read in the black chords upon a dulling page, music that is not meant for music's cage, whose emblems mix with words that shake and bleed. The staves are shuttled over 
with a stark, unprinted silence. In a double dream, I must spell out the storm, the running stream, the beats too swift, the notes shift in the dark. Now that I have your voice by heart, I read. Now that I have your heart by heart, I see the hawves with their great ships and architraves, the rigging and the cargo and the slaves on a strange beach under a broken sky. Oh, not departure, but a voyage done. The bales stand on the stone, the anchor weeps its red rust downward, and the long vine creeps beside the salt herb in the lengthening sun. Now that I have your heart by heart, I see. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Mr. Cunningham, I wonder if you'd read those two poems about Montana that made such impression at, at the Library of Congress last night. Well, thank you. This, this is the Montana of the Eastern Plains, not the mountains. Uh, the first Montana pastoral. I am no shepherd of a child's surmises. I have seen fear where the coiled serpent rises, thirst where the grasses burn in early May, and thistle, mustard, and the wild oat stay. There is dust in this air. I saw in the heat grasshoppers busy in the threshing wheat. So to this hour, through the warm dusk I drove to blizzards sifting on the hissing stove and found no images of pastoral will but fear, thirst, hunger, and this huddled chill. The second is entitled Montana 50 Years Ago. Gaunt kept house with her child for the old man. Met at the train, dust driven as the sink she came to, the child white as the alkali. To the west, distant mountains, the big lake to the northeast, dead trees and almost dead in the front yard, the front door locked and nailed, a hand pump in the sink. Outside the land of gophers, cottontails, and rattlesnakes, in good years of alfalfa, oats, and wheat. Root cellar, blacksmith shop, milk house and barn, granary, corral. An old world almanac to thumb at night, the child coughing, the lamp smoked, the chores done. So he came to her one night, to the front room, now bedroom, and moved in. Nothing was said, nothing was ever said, and then the child died and she disappeared. This was Montana 50 years ago. Thank you very much, Mr. Cunningham. As I said, Louise Bogan calls her most recent book, The Blue Estuaries. Uh, and I'd like to ask her now to read the uh, poem, one of the, her recent lyrics, uh, uh, entitled Night, from which I think that title is taken. Isn't yes. that right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> This, uh, of course, is a picture of the main coast. Night. The cold, remote islands and the blue estuaries where what breathes, breathes the restless wind of the inlets and what drinks, 
drinks the incoming tide, where shell and weed wait upon the salt wash of the sea, and the clear nights of stars swing their lights westward to set behind the land, where the pulse clinging to the rocks renews itself forever, where again on cloudless nights the water reflects the firmament's partial setting. Oh, remember in your narrowing dark hours that more things move than blood in the heart. Would you follow that by the dream? Uh, oh, I'd uh, be happy to. The uh, dream is a poem uh, written some years ago, and it's an actual uh, account of a nightmare. Uh, nightmares seem to be more well remembered than ordinary dreams. The dream. Oh God, in the dream, the terrible horse began to paw at the air and make for me with his blows. Fear kept for 35 years, poured through his mane, and retribution equally old or nearly breathed through his nose. Coward complete, I lay and wept on the ground when some strong creature appeared and leapt for the rain. Another woman, as I lay half in a swound, leapt in the air and clutched at the leather and chain. Give him, she said, something of yours as a charm. Throw him, she said, some poor thing you alone claim. No, no, I cried, he hates me, he's out for harm, and whether I yield or not, it is all the same. But, like a lion in a legend, when I flung the glove, pulled from my sweating, my cold right hand, the terrible beast that no one may understand came to my side and put down his head in love. I, I'm sure that that's a poem that will be very familiar to many in the audience because that's been in anthologies over a great many years, has it not? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Cunningham is a master of the short poem and particularly of the epigram, which is a form which uh, is uh, a, rare today. I think uh, at least the good epigrams are very rare. I wonder if you'd give us a few... Uh, uh, you want me to read some trash? <laughs> I would I would say rather some salt, as you call it in your last book. <laughs> uh, there is a a recurrent topic for the epitaph that I have attempted to do the the final statement of. <laughs> Here lies my wife. Eternal peace be to us both with her decease. <laughs> uh, in another vein, there, there is a character I call Junior Freud. An Oedipian mom and dad made Junior Freud feel pretty bad. And when they died, he was so vexed, he never after heterosexed. <laughs> Finally, the modern version of modern love. She has a husband, he a wife. What a way to spend a life. So whenever they are free, they synchronize adultery, and neither one would dare to stop without a simultaneous 
plot. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, I think we might uh, uh, now to turn to a few questions. There were uh, there was a question period at the library after uh, Miss Bogan and Mr. Cunningham read, and there were some rather interesting questions. There were there were a few that were quite impossible. There were there was one, uh, why write at all? Why not kill yourself? I think uh, the poets refused to answer that. But uh, I remember uh, Louise that uh, uh, one person said. Uh, 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 to you directly, uh, do you insist that a poem rhymes before you consider it finished? And would would you care to answer that again for? Well, I know, uh, I, but I certainly feel that rhyme is one of those devices that has been worked uh, through and uh, uh, improved really over the year, thousands of years that men have been writing poetry in form. It's a uh, it's a pleasure at its best. It's so uh, you know how children get two uh, words that rhyme and use them over and over again. It, uh, young people nowadays seem to think that rhyme is a kind of uh, kind of shackle, a kind of trap. But um, I think I said last night that uh, W. H. Auden, in speaking to a class of young students, uh, made the final point concerning form was that if they didn't use form, they did they, they didn't know what they were they were missing. Yes. Uh, would you care to add something to that, Jim? Well, uh, there's a general sense of achievement now in poets in being able to write a line that doesn't rhyme with any other line and isn't metrical. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, we had one other question which, which always comes up. I, people are always troubled by uh, obscurity. And uh, one uh, of the in the audience put the question this way. Uh, of what makes obscure poetry good, even if most readers can't understand it? And I said, what, just that? Just that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think, uh, Louise, you had something to add. Well, it seems that uh, all high, complicated, noble poetry is, is uh, difficult. Uh, King Lear is difficult. Oedipus Rex is difficult. Uh, people that uh, complain concerning the wasteland have never spent an afternoon trying to get through um, Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida, for example, <laughs> yes. which is exceedingly difficult and almost impenetrable, but it's a great, superb uh, piece of writing. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, sometimes the poet soars into... Obscurity. Obscurity, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, what, what, would you want to add something, Jim? <coughs> Well, the trouble is you don't know what it is they don't understand. That's it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. No. They don't. I think they one th is, is that uh, it's, it's difficult, it seems to me, always to explain to poets that, that, that the poet at least has to know what he's saying, and, and you can be pretty sure when you read the poem that he does, don't you think? Yes. yes. E even, if, even if he's trying to fox you, he knows that. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, there was one other rather interesting question that came up, and that was, uh, what other poets uh, uh, have you felt most akin to in spirit, as past or present? Uh, are there poets that you think of who, uh, far back in your schooling, uh, Louise, were particularly important to you? Well, as I said last night, I had the great good luck to have a teacher, an English teacher, as we called them in high school in those days, uh, who uh, was uh, one of those unmarried ladies who was wild about literature and uh, was terribly happy if she found any talent in her classes and devoted herself. I th I've spoken to other writers who have uh, known such women, such teachers, such devoted, uh, fanatical teachers, and it was a great pleasure and luck for a young person to meet such a woman. Uh, the uh, woman that I uh, knew in school was her name to Carolyn Gerrish, and she um, introduced us to uh, A.E. Houseman, who, who was pretty far out in those days. Of course, one looks down one's nose at him now, and you know, he's just an old formalist. But uh, <laughs> he was a great delight to uh, my generation, those who cared anything about poetry. And uh, Miss Gerrish also introduced us to George Herbert and the entire run of Metaphysicals, which uh, was quite early. They came into favor a little bit later. 
uh, Judge Herbert, uh, as you know, was very, very vigorous and uh, uh, serious and, uh, uh, what shall I say, lively as well as being. Indeed. And Jim, uh, well, can you think of a particular Yes, so, some uh, years ago, when the question was asked, it occurred to me that that Robinson, Evan Arlington Robinson, perhaps, would be the answer for me. Uh, are you thinking of, of some particular poems of him? No, of I'm thinking or, uh, of I'm thinking of a, a quality of style and of attitude. Uh, two quotations, very brief, occur to me: unobtrusive profundity, love builds of what time takes away, till death itself is less than change. Or on the uh, the spinster aunt. Nor was there anything to give a daily meaning to her life but the blank taste of time. That's very remarkable. I think you, you uh, are a great admirer, uh, Louise, as, as one born and brought up in Maine of, of uh, uh, Edwin Arnkin Robinson's... Yes. Uh, I think one, one uh, thing that he did, which people tend to overlook uh, when they look through his career from the end to the beginning, uh, they don't realize that how uh, tremendous uh, originality and uh, courage it took for him to uh, to describe the old failures and uh, bums and uh, tramps of the period and uh, uh, the, the people who drank too much, the people who did this or that, that through that uh, separated them from the uh, from the uh, situation as a whole, the uh, community. Uh, he, as we all know, those wonderful poems of the drunken old man having a party for himself on yes. under the moonlight. It, uh, nobody, pl nobody paid any attention to people like that until uh, Robinson came along. No, no Americans, at least. Well, the, of course, you were you were very influenced by by the by the classic writers too. The, the Latin uh, yes, poets. yes, of course. Uh, I was classics man. <laughs> I wonder now if we might have another. Uh, poem, Louise. Uh, would you read the Roman Fountain? Uh, oh, right. Isn't that mm -hmm. uh, yes, one that uh, we might? <laughs> this is a poem uh, written on my first visit to Italy. Roman Fountain. Up from the bronze. I saw water without a flaw rush to its rest in air, reach to its rest and fall. Bronze of the blackest shade, an element man made, shaping upright the bare, clear gouts of water in air. Oh, as with arm and hammer, Still, it is good to strive to beat out the image whole, to echo the shout and stammer when full gushed waters alive strike on the fountain's bowl after the air of summer. That's a very, very beautiful poem. Uh, and uh, Jim, I think you ha uh, have time to read uh, one or two more. All right. <coughs> Uh, I shall read Miramar Beach, in which I trust you can hear the Pacific Ocean on a Southern California beach. The night is still, the unfailing surf in passion and subsidence moves as at a distance. The glass walls and redwood are my utmost being. And is there, there, in the last shadow, there in the final privacies of unaccosted grace, is there gracing the tedium to death an intimation, something much like love, 
Like loneliness a drowse in states more primitive than peace in the warm wonder of winter sun. A brief dedicatory poem to my wife. And does the heart grow old? You know in the indiscriminate green of summer or in earliest snow, a landscape is another scene, inchoate and anonymous. And every rock and bush and drift, as our affections alter us, will alter with the season's shift. So love by love we come at last, as through the exclusions of a rhyme or the exactions of a past to the simplicity of time, the antiquity of grace, where yet we live in terror and delight with love as quiet as regret and a love like anger in the night. That's a beautiful poem. I think we have time for your epitaph, Jim, oh, here, right. uh, which yes. would be a nice one to conclude on. This is <clears throat> an epitaph for myself. When I shall be without regret, and shall mortality forget when I shall die who lived for this I shall not miss the things I miss and you who notice where I lie ask not my name it is not I that's really magnificent. Uh, one feels every word counts uh, in that. Uh, well, I think it's uh, it's been wonderful to have you have you here in Washington, it's I, a pleasure. I, and uh, I hope you'll come back uh, back often. You you know Washington, Louise. It's been yeah. some time since you've been here. I'm very fond of it. We've had uh, the pleasure of hearing uh, Louise Bogan and J. V. Cunningham, who are two of the country's most celebrated poets. Uh, Miss Bogan's most recent book is The Blue Estuaries, uh, poems 1923 to 1968. Uh, and uh, Mr. J.V. Cunningham has just published Some Salt, which is a collection of epigrams. They read last night at the Library of Congress. Louise Bogan and Mr. J.V. Cunningham appeared under the auspices of the Gertrude Clark Whittall Poetry and Literature Fund. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.